You guys know that I love big, bulky laptops because this channel is focused on getting the best bang for your buck when it comes to used machines. And what better bang for your buck is there than an enterprise grade mobile workstation? The thing is, this approach drives a lot of people away from our content because as we all know, the new hotness is thin, it's light, it's fewer ports, more dongles, less sourceability, and greater invasion of privacy. Good news for you guys, I don't care about following current trends. What I do care about is practicality and affordability above all. Now, what I realized towards the end of 2019 is that while I was addressing these two points, what I was lacking was variety, as for the most part, we were focusing on the ThinkPad T-Series. And while the T-Series is a great line of laptops, there are many more similarly priced models that provide more portability. So today, we are going to be doing a full Ultrabook build with a third generation X1 Carbon for under 350 bucks. Now my sister has been using a T410 for the past four years and she hasn't had a single issue with it. If you're looking for an ultra cheap office slash schoolwork machine and don't mind lugging around five pounds of laptop, then look no further than a T410 or T420. Though, if you want something significantly more portable and are willing to pay for it, then you might consider an X1 Carbon. And you might remember that I made a video on the second gen X1 Carbon a few months back and it wasn't very good. I would recommend staying clear of the first and second gen X1 Carbon, both because of some design choices and known chronic hardware failures. But after pushing out two mediocre models, the engineering and design team at Lenovo got their stuff together and gave us this, the third generation X1 Carbon, where we get our physical mouse buttons back and a physical function key row. And yes, while I would love some dedicated media keys, I'm just happy that the X1 Carbon is usable again because that second gen that we looked at was rough. There are still a few drawbacks though. Most of them are personal preferences, but I still think they are notable. First off, the RAM and CPU are soldered to the system board. However, this dual core i5 and eight gigabytes of DDR3 is going to be plenty for my sister. Just make sure you keep that in mind when you buy one of these uh, second hand. You're gonna to wanna to buy one uh, with system specs as far as the CPU and memory are concerned uh, that already fit your needs because you're not gonna be able to upgrade those later on. The port selection is Definitely a little lackluster, but once again, this is an Ultrabook, and for a Ultrabook like this, I think it's acceptable. Uh, you get two USB 3.0 ports, mini display port, a full-sized HDMI port, combo headphone microphone jack, Ethernet adapter port, and a micro SIM card tray to the rear of the laptop. Now, I really wish this thing had an SD card reader, but once again, that's just a personal preference of mine. I also really wish this X1 Carbon had a docking port on the bottom, but honestly, that's an unreasonable expectation for a laptop this thin. I mean, you guys know how much I love my docking stations, and yes, Lenovo does have an official USB uh, dock available for this laptop, but those just aren't as seamless as a traditional docking station where you can just take the laptop and drop it down onto the docking station and just have everything work. Before we go any further, and yes, I will run the usual benchmarks and comparisons on this laptop, we need to do some work. I bought this laptop for 233 bucks, including shipping. It came with a 256 gigabyte M.2 drive, Windows 10, and the 1440p touchscreen. I was really impressed with how good the screen looks, but more of that later on. The laptop didn't come with a battery, which isn't a big deal because I usually replace those anyway, so I bought a brand new 50 watt hour Lenovo battery off of eBay for $50. I also wanted a little more storage for my sister since this is gonna be her laptop all throughout college, so I picked up an Adata SU800 512 gigabyte solid state drive from Amazon for $58. The link to the X1 Carbon seller, SSD, and battery can be found down in the description. So normally when I'm working on one of these laptops, what I'll do is I'll have the hardware maintenance manual open on the screen in front of me so I can reference it while I'm tearing the laptop down. Well, I went ahead and did a run through of taking this third generation X1 Carbon apart so I would know what I'm talking about for this video. And it was so easy to take apart that I didn't have to reference the hardware uh, maintenance manual once. Now, of course, if you guys still are interested in checking out the uh, HMM 
I will put the link to it down in the description. Maybe uh, for one reason or another, I don't explain something very well and you run into trouble. We'll go ahead and check out the uh, HMM uh, and it should be able to walk you through the uh, disassembly process uh, for tearing down this X1 carbon. And by the way, if you don't know what the hardware maintenance manual is, uh, it basically tells you everything you need to know about a ThinkPad, how to uh, remove the solid state drive, how to take the back cover off, how to tear down the LCD. Anything and everything you would want to know about taking apart this laptop can be found in the HMM. But anyway, enough about talking about taking apart this laptop. Let's actually take it apart. So to take the back panel off, you have to remove one, two, three, four, five, six, seven screws. The back panel will pop up, you can pull it off, and then you have access to pretty much everything you really would ever want to have access to um, for this laptop. So I'm gonna start at the bottom right corner here from my view, uh, and we are going to work our way all the way around, removing all of these screws. And with our Phillips head screwdriver, which is really all you should need for the disassembly of this laptop, um, with our screwdriver, we removed all those screws. We can pop the back panel off by grabbing uh, on the back side of the laptop here. This is actually uh, raised a little bit. If you can see it, um, once you remove all the screws, it'll pop up a little bit so you can get your fingers under it, pull it up. And then I think this screw is still in here. So I'm gonna loosen this just a little bit more. And then it should just, there we go, pop off and up and out. So the back panel is now removed. And you can see, as I said earlier, uh, we have access to pretty much everything uh, we would ever want to have access to for this X1 carbon. So the solid state drive is right here. We are going to, wow, oh no. What in the world? So someone, I'm guessing this was an upgrade maybe, um, but someone really botched this upgrade because this screw is not in there right. I'm not sure if you guys can see that. Uh, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to uh, throw in some B-roll footage here, but uh, in the B-roll footage, you can see that someone put the screw in like sideways and I'm hoping that it didn't strip any threads in there um, so I can get a new screw and put it in there uh, and have that secure our new solid state drive. Uh, because if they strip the threads, it's going to make things a little bit more difficult. Still doable, um, but something I would really rather not deal with. Um, so we can see the heat sink for the processor right here. We are going to end up removing this because I want to apply a uh, new thermal paste to that CPU. This is uh, Arctic MX4. I know people are going to give me a bunch of flack about putting this on a laptop CPU, but honestly, it works. I've done it before. No problem since it's the only thing I have lying around. So we're just going to make the best of what we have. And then, of course, this empty space right here is where our brand new Lenovo battery is going to go. It's just going to drop in like so, and I will tell you how to do all of that in the coming minutes. So we're going to start out easy here, and honestly, everything about the three upgrades that we're about to do is pretty easy. Um, the hardest part is going to be the battery, and that's just because we're going to have to remove like five or six screws and then put those back in. It's, it's just time consuming. It's not even difficult. Uh, but I'm going to start with the M.2 solid state drive right here. So this screw is uh, completely done. I managed to get it out and the threads aren't stripped uh, in that hole, so that's good news. But the um, face of the screw, the top of the screw is just absolutely mangled. Someone did a, uh, did a number on this one. So we're just going to pull this screw out and toss it away because we're never going to use that again. And what we're going to do is we're going to use this screw right here as a surrogate screw for our new Adata solid state drive. So I'm going to pull this one out, push it off to the side over here. And what we're going to do with this drive is just remove it. So as you can see, when I took out the screw, it popped up. Now all we had to do is pull it out. And that's it. Really easy. And then exact opposite for uh, a data solid state drive. Put it in at an angle first. I, I'd probably say about a 30 degree angle. Uh, push it in. Make sure you slide it in all the way. You shouldn't be able to see the contacts anymore. Push it down. And now we can secure it with our new screw that we stole from the uh, other card slots. And these screws are a little tricky to get back in, but if you take your time, 
Uh, that didn't go in right. If you take your time and eye it to make sure you got it in right, eventually you will get it. And there we go. We have our Adata 512 gigabyte solid state drive successfully installed. Next, I'm going to move on to the thermal paste. I think I could probably just do it without making a cut here. So you can see the heat sink. Um, everything is held down by these four screws. So you, all you have to do is uh, remove these four screws. You can peel the uh, heat sink back, clean it off, put new thermal paste on it, and then put it back down. And that's really it. So we're going to do that all right now. So once again, one screw here, one screw here, one screw here, and one screw here. Remove all of those. And then you can pull this section of the heat sink right off. And this Phillips head screwdriver is a little bit too big, so I'm gonna switch out for this one. There we go, we have all four of these screws out. And uh, mind this, there is a ribbon cable right here connecting the heatsink fan to the motherboard. Uh, just be delicate in this process. You don't have to unplug it unless you really want to. Um, just be delicate when you're pulling the heatsink back and flipping it over. Uh, you don't want to tear that ribbon cable. So we're gonna pull up. And it might take a little bit of force because um, the heat sink will be stuck to the CPU thanks to that uh, old thermal paste. So it, it takes a little bit of effort to kind of pry it off. There we go. So that kind of popped off there. And I can just flip this back like so. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna take your 70% uh, isopropyl rubbing alcohol and a paper towel, uh, and you're just going to clean the surfaces of both the heat sink um, and the CPU right here. So I cut the video because after I got the thermal paste off, I realized there's a uh, little plastic um, kind of outline right here. And I was worried that was blocking contact between the uh, heatsink and the CPU. Um, but it's actually not because there's a cutout right here in the plastic to allow uh, thermal contact between the uh, CPU heatsink uh, and the dies on the CPU. So that's not a big deal. I've just never seen any plastic surrounding uh, like this before. So that was kind of a curveball for me, but no big deal there. So what we're gonna do now is I'm gonna open up this tube of thermal paste and we're just gonna put a uh, dot on each die. So one small dot here. That was a little more than I wanted to. Uh, that'll be fine though. And then uh, get a smaller dot here. There we go. So with that in place, I'm gonna put the cap back on. And I can flip this over carefully. Once again, you don't wanna tear that ribbon cable, so be gentle here. I'm going to line it up, and then we're going to drop it in. And screw the heat sink back in place. The exact opposite procedure um, that we did to get it out. Of course, you don't want to tighten these uh, down just yet, so we're going to screw them in. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to screw this bottom right one all the way in from my point of view. So this is bottom right for me. Uh, and then we're gonna go in a uh, cross pattern. Top left, bottom left, and then top right. And I'm gonna go over each one one more time. Make sure they're nice and tight. And that is good. So we are done with reapplying the thermal paste and all we have left to do is the battery, which once again is the hardest part for this video. Um, but that's not to say that's actually going to be difficult. So let's pull some of these screws out and drop this battery in. So obviously the nice thing about buying a laptop with no battery in it is that we do not have to remove the old battery to install this brand new battery that I bought off eBay. All I have to do is uh, take the screws out of here, drop this in and then secure it down with said screws. Um, don't worry though, if you have a X1 Carbon third generation where you're replacing a dying battery or a completely dead battery, uh, the process is actually really easy. All you're gonna do is remove uh, five screws total. So there's gonna be one screw uh, on each corner of the battery. So one screw right here, one right here, one right here, and one right there. And then of course, I said there's five, so there's also a screw in the center, which you will have to remove. You remove all five of those screws, unplug the ribbon cable, and then pull the battery out. It's really that simple. To install the battery, 
what I'm going to have to do, and thankfully um, the previous owner left the screws for the battery uh, in their places, is I'm going to have to remove all the screws uh, from the laptop first and then reinstall the screws to secure the battery in place. And that's it. So before you uh, screw everything in, it's actually easier to plug the ribbon cable in first. So we're going to go ahead um, and I guess it's not really, it's not really a ribbon cable. It's just a cable with a bunch of wires, uh, but go ahead and plug the battery cable in before you install it via the screws. I'm just going to use my nails and kind of push the connector in place. And that should do the trick. I cut there because I ran into uh, what really isn't that much of an issue, but something I was a little worried about. So when I uh, secured the battery down and aligned uh, the screw holes up, I noticed that there is a lot of pressure on these cables right here. Uh, as you can see, when you uh, push the battery into place, let me sec. And by the way, there are these uh, two little plastic tabs uh, to the top of the battery. You need to make sure these go under the motherboard when you install it. So they should slide under the board, like so. You can see that when the battery is properly installed, it's actually like pushing these cables up uh, in a sort of uh, arc, which I, I don't really like. Um, because I'm worried about it breaking uh, the connections inside the battery or um, at the connector. It's just a lot of pressure, and I'm not a huge fan of that. I did power the laptop on, uh, and it does work this way, but for longevity's sake, I don't know. I, I'm kind of raising my eyebrows at this, but we're going we're gonna to give it a shot because I can't find a better way to kind of move these cables uh, in a better position. So it's going to have to do for now. And I looked for hints in the uh, hardware maintenance manual and online and I couldn't really find anything so I'm just going to assume this is how this is supposed to be. So if that's said and done, I'm going to put all five of those screws back in and then what we're going to do is we are going to close up the case, power this thing back on. I need to uh, install Windows 10 for my sister because she is uh, a Windows user. I know a lot of my audience loves Linux and would like to see me put Linux on this machine, uh, but unfortunately, uh, you know, my, my sister is not a person who is a huge Linux fan, so uh, this is going to be a Windows machine. And then we'll put the last screw in. I'll check one more time to make sure all the screws are tight. And you don't want them to be super tight where you can't get them back out or you strip the threads or anything like that. Just tight enough to where they're not going to uh, wiggle themselves out of place. So that's all done. What we're going to do now is pop the back back on. And then I'm just going to re-secure all the screws around here. And that's it. We have uh, upgraded our solid state drive. We upgraded the, well, we installed the battery because it didn't have a battery in it before. Uh, and we replaced the thermal paste. So in theory, this laptop should be good to go um, for really another five years at the minimum. With the new SSD, there is no doubt about it that this X1 Carbon is blazing fast when it comes to daily use tasks. Office applications are nothing for this machine and web browsing and HD video streaming are silky smooth. The laptop does get hot at max load as the tiny heatsink in this thing struggles to cool the i5-5300U. However, even though it runs hot, over 10 minutes of stress testing, the CPU didn't throttle once. Actual battery life hovers around 5 to 6 hours, which is plenty for a day away from an outlet. Scoring a measly 700 in Fire Strike, it's clear that you won't be running new AAA titles. However, some new Wish 3D games are playable at their lowest settings. Borderlands, the pre-sequel, ran between 20 to 30 frames per second at 1600 by 900 with all settings put at low, and Minecraft was also playable at low settings with the resolution dropped down to 1080p. Though this is an upgrade from my sister's T410 as you can see from the passmark results between the two, once again, 
keep in mind that a similarly priced used workstation such as the W540 will absolutely annihilate X1 Carbon when it comes to performance. As long as you're not worried about the extra weight, a mobile workstation is a much better buy. Heck, even a T-Series uh, will give you a little bit more bang for your buck. I do have to admit though, I really like how portable this 3 pound Ultrabook is. And the 2560 by 1440 display was a great surprise since the listing did not specify screen resolution. The display is super sharp and the viewing angles are excellent. Though I've never understood the point of touch screens on laptops outside of design work, this model is equipped with one and it works fairly well. So that was really the first ultra portable build I've ever done on the channel. Now I did do a little bit of work with the second gen X1 Carbon in a previous video where I put it up against a HP stream uh, to compare a used laptop and new laptop of the same price, um, but I don't really consider that a full build. Um, so this is the first ultra book we've thrown together uh, and sent out to someone, in this case my sister and this should last her all the way through college because this is a really really nice ultra book um, even though I'm not a fan of these slim machines I do like this x1 carbon third gen it turned out to be a uh, great little daily use college laptop so with all of that said guys this is going to be about it for the video if you have any uh, other build recommendations maybe some other uh, ultra books that you would like to see featured on the channel go ahead and put them down in the comment section don't forget to drop a like on this video if you didn't like this video please tell me why and of course if you uh, enjoyed this video and you're not already subscribed to the channel consider doing so once again all the links to everything featured in this video will be down in the description uh, along with a link to a bunch of hd images of this x1 carbon third generation if you want to uh, get a couple more angles of this laptop. If you found this video useful and you think others might find it useful too, then maybe consider posting it to relevant subreddits, Facebook groups, etc, etc. Um, only to the relevant ones. Don't just go spamming my content all over the place because then that gets people really angry at you and really angry at me as well. Um, so don't do that. But if you think some other people might benefit from this video, uh, then feel free to uh, post the content there because it really does help us as far as exposure is concerned. These videos are rarely featured in YouTube's uh, recommendations um, and any extra exposure does uh, help us out a lot. So that would be much appreciated. That's going to be about it for this video. Once again, guys, thanks for watching and I will see you in the next installment of A Computers and Technology. I was about to hit render on this video and then I remembered something and I really don't know how I forgot it because it annoyed me uh, during the entire filming of this video and that's the fact that whenever you close the lid on this laptop and open it again it leaves an imprint of the keyboard on the screen and it drives me absolutely mad. Why would you design it like this? Arrgh.